This talk is actually um, sooner than I would like to have given it. Uh, it's driven by events uh, that necessitate addressing the subject, and I didn't want to put it off because if, if, if I'm going to deal with this in something that's written, it would be 18 months or more from now before I could even begin on it. There are so many other projects that I have. But the fact is that there are, um, there are such numbers of those who have been polygamous, who have recently been rebaptized, that th there is a need for someone to do the work of clarifying and addressing the subject so that people do not lapse back into mistakes. Therefore, uh, this talk is being given, <clears throat> driven by the needs that currently exist and not necessarily by whether or not um, I want to give this talk today. Uh, it just needs to be done, and so I'm, I'm going to do it. This talk is not an attempt to explain what Brigham Young thought what John Taylor thought, what Orson Pratt thought, or what any of these other men who have gone on the record and elaborated upon this subject thought. You have all their material in front of you. If you want to know what they think, it's available to you. We are interested only in one thing, and that is what did Joseph Smith understand? What did Joseph Smith teach? What did Joseph Smith attempt to establish on the subject of the plurality of wives? Joseph Smith's writings and recorded instructions on plural marriage are limited to the revelation on celestial and plural marriage doctrine and covenants 132. Period. That's it. That's all we have. Now that we have that, we have a series of historical events that have taken place which color our ability to look back and to understand what it was that Joseph Smith was revealing in section 132. Today I am not going to make any attempt to go over all of the stuff that I have covered previously in passing the heavenly gift, or on the blog. And I printed all that out. I've written a surprising amount on the blog, and all of that I believe to be absolutely consistent with my current understanding and consistent with what is in passing the heavenly gift and consistent with the truth as I understand it. Now, I know that there are people who, when it comes to the subject of plural marriage, like the subject for a variety of reasons. They may like it because of historical curiosity. They may like it because their ancestors were involved in the practice. They may like it because they use it as a tool with which to beat up other Mormons. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why people enjoy the subject. I came to the subject of plural marriage very slowly and very cautiously and completely indifferently. I didn't have any ancestors that were involved in the practice. I didn't have a dog in that fight. I didn't care. The only thing I was interested in was trying to understand it. What became remarkably apparent to me is that what we think we know on the subject of plural marriage is informed almost entirely by events that occurred in history after the death of Joseph Smith and very little by what we learned during the life of Joseph Smith. There is a tendency to attribute to Joseph things that he had no connection to. There's also an enormous distortion to the historical lens as we look back to try and see what Joseph Smith was doing because of the series of events that took place both during Joseph's lifetime and after. There's even some amount of historical 
detritus that's hanging around as far back as the 1600s to the mid 1700s that um, come from um, Emanuel Swedenborg that some people believe inspired Joseph Smith. I don't believe that. There's also a fellow named Jacob Cochran. Jacob Cochran uh, advocated the practice of what he called spiritual wifery. He may have had an influence on some people that were involved in Mormonism. He does not appear to have had any influence whatsoever on Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith's vocabulary never included the term spiritual wives or spiritual wivery. That was a phrase that was coined by uh, Jacob Cochran, and interestingly enough, was the same phrase that John Bennett would use when John Bennett was practicing what he did in Nauvoo. So while Jacob Cochran had no apparent influence upon Joseph Smith's thinking, he may very well have influenced the thinking of Mormonism in the person of John Bennett. John Bennett becomes the very first historical distortion to our understanding of what Joseph Smith was doing. Because John Bennett became the uh, mayor of Nauvoo. He, he assisted in getting the Nauvoo charter done. He was um, a confidant inside the highest circles of the church. And it was assumed that John Bennett knew what he was doing and talking about and um, he couldn't leave the subject around, alone. So we're going to talk about John Bennett. But before we begin, I want to mention that uh, Brian Hales has done a, um, a good job in trying to isolate Joseph Smith and looking at the practice of polygamy involving Joseph Smith alone. He's put together three volumes of material on the subject of Joseph Smith's polygamy, and I'm going to use a couple of those volumes to read historical sources. The good thing about the work that Brian Hale has done is that he has isolated the historic source, he preserves the historic source, and then when he offers his opinion about it, he makes it clear that this is his opinion from the material. This is how he wants to interpret it or the suggestion that he wants to make. And I like that because I disagree with a lot of the interpretations that he makes. I don't have any disagreement with his gathering of the historical material or of his quoting of the historical material. So as we ease into this subject, I want to suggest that um, interpreting the material and making attribution to Joseph Smith of behavior, of understanding, of teaching, and of doctrine is something that I think we ought to be extremely circumspect about doing. I believe Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. We sing a hymn that says, Jesus anointed that prophet and seer. If that hymn be true, and I think it is, then Joseph Smith is included among those who are anointed by the Lord, about whom we should be very careful of evil speaking. Attributing to Joseph Smith sexual indiscretion that he was not actually involved with, and assuming that you know the heart of that man when you don't is something that you ought to be awfully careful about. There are a lot of people who are looking at the historical record and accepting the distortions of the various events think that Joseph Smith was sexually promiscuous, uh, given to having sexual relations with other women, uh, involved in the very kinds of sexual misdeeds that he condemned. 
all of those who have written about the subject, who have gone to the trouble of carefully examining the record, take the reputation that has been developed through history concerning Joseph's sexual activity and dialed it back dramatically. Those that have looked at it most carefully become the most equivocal on things that people take for granted that Joseph Smith did. I'm no longer willing to be equivocal. I'm willing to say that from the totality of the circumstances, I do not believe that Joseph Smith was ever involved in adultery. I do not believe that Joseph Smith was ever involved in bigamy. It would be bigamous to marry another woman for this life when you have an existing wife. Joseph Smith had a wife. When he looked around in Nauvoo and said, there are, women, there are people here who say, I'm married to numerous women and I look around the crowd and I can see but one, meaning Emma. I think he was telling the truth. First we'll look at the record, then we'll look at the whys. Because I think what Joseph was really doing was never preserved in the restoration and has not been understood. How far I'll go in that today, I don't know. Brian Hales invited me <coughs> to participate with him in jointly writing a book, and I actually started on that process. I've since changed my mind, and I'm not going to... I've, I've got too many more important things to do, and so that, that won't happen. But I began... Um, I want to read you some of what I started with. The talents of the historian, the grammarian, the lawyer, and the researcher can lead them to offer conclusions and attempt to persuade others to agree with their insight, but in the end, the answers do not exist. All those involved, and the universe of those that were involved is quite small, died without providing a trustworthy account which would have given us the truth. We can guess to whether or not they did this wittingly or unwittingly. If it was unwittingly, then we might be encouraged in our quest to reconstruct the events. But if it was instead done wittingly, then we are immediately faced with the issue of why. Why did they deliberately leave a historic lacuna on the subject which would later both jar Mormonism and the United States? Perhaps nothing has so altered the history of the faith established through Joseph Smith than his introduction of plural marriage. It resulted in national scandal, federal legislation, postponement of the statehood for Utah, confiscation of LDS church property, barring Mormons from voting or serving on juries, schisms and lingering social and familial scars that remain part of the Mormon landscape to the present. Joseph's own sons, David and Joseph III, relied on Emma's carefully parsed denials and provoked Joseph F. Smith's quest to gather affidavits decades after the fact to document the earlier practices of their father. The lawsuit over the temple lot focused in part on the controversy in resolving ownership of property in independence previously set apart for a temple to be constructed. Senator Reed Smoot's election as senator for Utah was stalled for years while hearings were convened to determine his suitability as a United States senator over this issue. President Joseph F. Smith testified in these hearings. In short, the subject cannot be called unimportant. If Joseph Smith had the foresight of a prophet, it is reasonable to assume it was a deliberate, witting decision to leave the record uninformed by his own account of the chronology of plural marriage. More interesting still is that likewise, neither Oliver Cowdery nor Fanny Alger thought it our business to tell us definitely what went on as plural marriage was introduced, first in theory and then in practice. With this conspiracy of silence by those principles directly knowledgeable about the introduction, it begs the additional question, 
If this is deliberate, why the silence? Was it the result of reticence in a prudish society? It's a reasonable conclusion, but Joseph Smith was a religious revolutionary whose private life, even private thoughts, became relevant for the record. He discloses, for example, his own, quote, deep and often poignant, unquote, feelings about his encounter with God. Sharing his inner feelings, his nearly unprecedented use of seer stones and other difficult to understand, much less believe, information about his life did not deter him in other respects. Yet on this subject, we have almost nothing from him. Was it because he believed the Lord did not want the information available? There were subjects about which Joseph Smith knew we would very much care, but which he could not provide us with information because the Lord wanted it withheld. For example, during an early church conference in 1831, he was asked by his brother Hiram to explain how the Book of Mormon was brought forth. It's actually more than that. I mean, Hiram introduced the subject and said he was turning time over to his brother, who would now tell you about the story of the Book of Mormon coming forth. In response, Joseph explained, quote, it was not intended to tell the world all the particulars of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and it was not expedient for him to relate these things, unquote. There is no comparable statement made about the origin of plural marriage. Instead, we are left with silence and the challenge of deciding what to do about the missing information. As a result of this omission, we have the freedom to guess if we lack the self-control to refrain from doing so. In a circumstance in which we are left to venture out our own speculation about the matter, I first ask why. Is there a purpose behind leaving us to our own to sort out something so shocking, culturally out of step, and deeply personal as plural marriage? I ventured to offer it was wittingly done precisely to prove us. Our reaction to this topic lets us put on display what is in our heart. We get to project onto the blank screen something about ourselves as we expose our presumptions, suspicions, and attributions to Joseph Smith. In his three-volume work, Joseph Smith's Polygamy, the underlying proof to the extent it exists is well gathered and presented. It represents the best to date in reconstructing the fragments from which we can reconstruct the theoretical history to the extent it can be done at all. I take issue with the speculative chronolo- I take issue with the speculative chronology in these books, not with the underlying proof gathered by Brian Hales. It's an appropriate it is appropriate in my view to accept the documentary stage that he sets with only one edition as it's set out in uh, Hales' three volumes and then move on to a discussion, the correct conclusion to be drawn from the available evidence rather than to dispute the evidence itself. The only addition I would make to the uh, record is a statement made by Brigham Young in, um, on July the 26th of 1872 in a talk he gave in the Salt Lake City 14th Ward and I'm reading from um, the collected discourses of, uh, or the complete discourses of Brigham Young, volume five. Um, quote, said that while Joseph and Oliver were translating the Book of Mormon, they had a revelation that the order of patriarchal marriage and the sealing was right. Oliver said to Joseph, Brother Joseph, Why don't we go into the order of polygamy and practice it as the ancients did? We know it is true. Then why delay? Joseph's reply was, I know that we know it is true and from God, but the time has not yet come. This did not seem to suit Oliver, who expressed a determination to go 
into the order of plural marriage anyhow, although he was ignorant of the order and pattern and the results. Joseph said, Oliver, if you go into this thing, it is not with my faith or consent. Disregarding the counsel of Joseph, Oliver Cowdery took to wife Miss Annie Lyman, cousin to George A. Smith. Um, now, there's a problem with that um, because, first of all, he's quoting, he's quoting the conversation that takes place between Oliver and Joseph and apparently quoting this off the top of his head. He wasn't there. He didn't hear the conversation. He didn't know what actually transpired and he doesn't tell us where he got the information from that he gives to us there. I think that belongs within the record of the chronology because I put the, the moment at which the first portion of DNC section 132 was given in 1829 and not in uh, 1832. Well, the earliest intrusion of the topic of uh, plural wives that we can find anywhere is in a, a court proceeding that happened before the Far West High Council in April of 1838 in which um, there were seven charges that were preferred against Oliver Cowdery uh, in a church disciplinary council uh, leading up to the excommunication of Oliver Cowdery. The second charge, and I'll read it to you, second, for seeking to destroy the character of President Joseph Smith Jr. by falsely insinuating that he was guilty of adultery, etc. In the transcript of the um, hearing, uh, when you get far enough into the record, one of the witnesses testified concerning Oliver Cowdery. He seemed to insinuate that Joseph Smith Jr. was guilty of adultery, but when the question was put if he, Joseph, had ever acknowledged to him that he was guilty of such a thing, when he answered, no. Then another witness, David Patton, testified that he went to Oliver Cowdery to inquire of him if a certain story was true respecting J. Smith's committing adultery with a certain girl when he turned on his heel and insinuated as though he was guilty. He went on and gave a history of some circumstances respecting the adultery scrape, alleging that no doubt it was true. Thomas March testified that while he was in Kirtland last summer, David W. Patton asked Oliver Cowdery if he, Joseph Smith Jr., had confessed to his wife that he was guilty of adultery with a certain girl when Oliver cocked up his eye very knowingly and hesitated to answer the question, saying he did not know as he was bound to answer the question, yet conveyed the idea it was true. Joseph Smith testified in the hearing. Joseph Smith Jr. testifies that Oliver Cowdery had been his bosom friend, therefore he entrusted him with many things. He then gave a history respecting, and these are the words from the record, the girl business, okay? Then the record goes on, and I'm, I'm only lifting out excerpts from these pages, okay? After um, the council deliberated it was decided by the bishop and his council that the first, second, and third charges were sustained. It was the second charge that dealt with adultery, the false accusation of adultery. So Oliver Cowdery, the complaint that he was falsely attributing to Joseph Smith the charge of adultery was sustained. Um, satisfactorily by the circumstantial evidence, the ninth charge was sustained. He was therefore considered no longer a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is the um, high council record that occurred in the court um, in 1838. Oliver was excommunicated. Joseph Smith was um, taken prisoner. He was um, confined in Liberty Jail. He lost his um, 
history of the church uh, during the same 1838 uh, time frame because uh, other uh, of the three witnesses also left the faith. And so he began to recreate the history of the church in 1838 after the court involving these allegations and before he would be arrested and spend time in Liberty Jail. As Joseph Smith was writing his history in 1838, he was writing it in the wake of events, including the allegations that had been raised in the church disciplinary court involving Oliver Cowdery. The charge of adultery was in front of them. And, and his history begins, owing to the many reports which have been put in circulation by evil disposed and designing persons in relation to the rise and progress of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, all of which have been designed by the authors thereof to militate against its character as a church and its progress in the world, I've been induced to write this history to disabuse the public mind and put all inquirers after truth in possession of the facts as they have transpired in relation both to myself and the church so far as I have such facts in my possession. He goes on to explain within this history written in the wake of that court proceeding, I was left to all kinds of temptations, mingled with all kinds of society. I frequently fell into many foolish errors, displayed the weaknesses of youth and the foibles of human nature, which I'm sorry to say led me into diverse temptations offensive in the sight of God. In making this confession, no one need suppose me guilty of any great or malignant sins. A disposition to commit such was never in my nature. But I was guilty of levity and sometimes associated with jovial company and so on, not consistent with that character which ought to be maintained by, them, by one that was called of God as I had been. So Joseph is making it clear. He acknowledges his sins, foibles, and weaknesses, but he did not commit malignant sins. Fanny Alger may have been Joseph Smith's first plural wife. She subsequently married a man. Between her and her husband, she bore nine children. Joseph Smith fathered with Emma Smith eight children. But in the prime of their reproductive years, Joseph Smith and Fanny Alger produced no children. There's an account that is preserved in the record that Hales assembled about um, Emma Smith observing the transaction in the barn. Once again, there's nothing other than those words given to what happened. Emma Smith came to the barn from an, a jar door, was able to observe inside the barn, Joseph Smith, Fanny Alger, and Levi Hancock. Levi was given the words of a ceremony to marry the two of them for all eternity. This was the transaction in the barn, and Emma overheard the transaction. If you take all of the material gathered by Hales and you consider it as one, the transaction in the barn did not involve Joseph in a haystack with a gal caught in the very act by Emma, as a number of people have asserted. Even good faith Mormons believe that nonsense. Even people who have um, the desire to uphold Joseph Smith as a prophet have attributed to him 
illicit sexual encounter in the barn between Joseph and Fanny Alger, witnessed by Emma Smith, which was the substance that was tried in the Oliver Cowdery Court. And it becomes clear that whatever went on in the barn did not involve adultery. Did not involve adultery. Brian Hales goes through and makes an elaborate effort to demonstrate that Joseph Smith may have had sexual relations with, and he takes the entire number of known or suspected wives, and he ratchets it down to a handful, and he says, okay, with these it is possible. Let me um, suggest an analytical framework that might be useful. Because... I would not want to be someone responsible for attributing to Joseph Smith something which is not true. I don't want to attribute a lie to him. Joseph Smith, if he be a prophet of God, is entitled to only be convicted on the same standards we would convict anyone else. As a lawyer, I know that if you're going to convict someone of inappropriate conduct bordering on criminality, your burden of proving that is beyond any reasonable doubt. If you've got a reasonable doubt about it, then you don't go forward and convict. I think a prophet of God on this subject is entitled to the same kind of deference. Therefore, if there's reason to doubt, I say we ought doubt, and we ought not say, yes, yes, now we know the truth, and we know that we can attribute to Joseph Smith actions which... Um, are not, are not his to own. Reading from Brian Hale's uh, volume one on page um, 391, he observes, none of these women left a specific record of how Joseph Smith explained the principle of plural marriage to them, the specific path they followed to become to come to an acceptance of the principle or what exactly it meant to them in terms of their daily lives and activities. <clears throat> we don't have the information from which we can reconstruct it. He does think that um, uh, Eliza Snow may have been one of the women with whom Joseph Smith had sexual intercourse. However, he also quotes an 1877 letter from Eliza to RLDS missionary Daniel Munns. This is the hand of uh, Eliza R. Snow writing this letter. You asked, referring to President Smith, did he authorize or practice spiritual livery? Were you a spiritual wife? I certainly shall not acknowledge myself of having been a carnal one. This is uh, Eliza Snow. If she's not a carnal wife, then what does that mean? To be, I mean, the term that's being used in the letter is, is the term that the missionary wrote to her and inquired to her about, and therefore um, she used that, that term. In all of the efforts that have been made to try and track down putative offspring and descendants of Joseph Smith, the DNA testing has resulted in not one child ever having been established as Joseph's. There are those that say that's not good enough because some of the DNA testing cannot prove one way or the other, it's equivocal. But to say that is to concede the point that you don't have proof. So in the absence of proof, you're going to attribute one of the best comments that's most useful to try and resolve the issue is a dying woman speaking to her, she's now quite elderly, her full-grown daughter on her deathbed saying to the daughter on her deathbed, which got repeated in the 1930s, you, daughter, have Joseph Smith as your father. So we've got that statement. We presume that the dying mother 
would not die with a lie on her lips saying you were a daughter of Joseph Smith. If this woman was sealed to Joseph Smith for all eternity, it would not matter who the biological father of that child was. On her dying bed, she would want her daughter to know it doesn't matter who your biological father is. You are a daughter of Joseph Smith because she was sealed to Joseph. And there's no question about that. You can reach a contrary conclusion if you want to do so. But I'm telling you, the proof is not sufficient to justify those kinds of conclusions. In Rough Stone Rolling, uh, Richard Bushman writes, the husband knew of the plural marriage and proved in cases where Joseph married other women. The relationship would bear fruits in the afterlife. There is no certain evidence that Joseph had sexual relations with any of the wives who were married to other men. The personal anguish caused by plural marriage did not stop Joseph Smith from marrying more women. Joseph did not marry women to form a warm human companionship, but to create a network of related wives, children, and kinsmen that would endure into eternity. The revelation on marriage promised Joseph an hundredfold in this world of fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, houses and lands, wives and children, and crowns of eternal lives in the eternal worlds. Like Abraham of old, Joseph yearned for familial plentitude. He did not lust for women so much as he lusted for kin. Romance played only a slight part. In making proposals, Joseph would sometimes say God had given a woman to him, or they were meant for each other. But there was no romantic talk of adoring love. He did not court his prospective wives by first trying to win their affections. In trying to figure out what Joseph was all about, going back to the, the record of his talks, when it comes to the subject of sexual relations and the statements that we know that we can attribute to Joseph Smith, they were largely confined to denouncing adultery. They were largely confined to advocating chastity. In fact, at one point, Joseph Smith said that an adulterer will not enter into the celestial kingdom. Even if they enter into any kingdom, it cannot be the celestial kingdom. You're forced to choose, really, between circumstantial proof compounded by conjecture on the assumption that Joseph Smith was a vile hypocrite or take him at his word and accept what he says about himself and believe and trust in what he said about himself. Well, why would we not? <clears throat> One of the obstacles to getting the truth is Mr. John C. Bennett. In the Times and Seasons edition for June the 15th of 1842, there's a little notice on, on the last page of the paper, a little notice that appears that says, notice, the subscribers, Members of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints withdrew the hand of fellowship from General John C. Bennett. As a Christian, he having been labored with from time to time to persuade him to amend his conduct, apparently to no good effect. Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, William Law. The following members of the Quorum of the Twelve concur in the above sentiments, and then they list the names of Brigham Young, Heber Kimball, Lyman Wright, William Smith, John Page, John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff, George A. Smith, and Willard Richards. And then we concur in the above and then the names of the bishops. That's the notice. That was the only thing that was intended to be done to deal with John C. Bennett. 
John C. Bennett did not go quietly into that good night. And when you get to the July 1st edition of the Times and Seasons, almost the entire edition is devoted to dealing with John Bennett. Because as soon as the notice was published, he went out of his way to try and make it clear that he was the good guy and that Joseph Smith and the Mormons were the bad guys. And he began to invent and attribute to Joseph Smith and the members of the church things that he had done. So the Times and Seasons for July 1st, the first lead article says, it becomes my duty to lay before the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the public generally some important facts relative to the conduct and character of Dr. John C. Bennett, who has lately been expelled from the aforesaid church, that the honorable part of the community may be aware of his proceedings and be ready to treat and regard him as he ought to be regarded, that is, as an imposter and base adulterer. See, the little notice said nothing about this. Now they have to get into the facts. It mentions that a communication was received at Nauvoo from a person of respectable character and residing in the vicinity where Bennett had lived. This letter cautioned us against him, setting forth that he was a very mean man and had a wife and two or three children in McConaughville, Morgan County, Ohio. The above letter was kept quiet but held in reserve. They didn't trust the information in the letter, but they knew it much earlier on it's just that jo Joseph had the problem of John Bennett and he was always willing to accept rep repentance. They dealt with him finally, threatening to expose him if he did not uh, desist. He only broke off his publicly wicked actions. Um, he went to some of the females in the city who knew nothing of him but as an honorable man and began to teach them that promiscuous intercourse between the sexes was a doctrine believed in by the Latter-day Saints. He persuaded them that myself and others of the authorities of the church not only sanctioned, but practiced the same wicked acts. And when asked why I publicly preached so much against it, said that it was because of the prejudice of the public and that it would cause trouble in my own house. So the females that he was trying to persuade to participate with him said, okay, but why is Joseph always denouncing this in public? Oh, that's the key piece at home and because he doesn't want it to get up. He, he persuaded them there would be no harm if they should not make it known. He seduced an innocent female by his line. Not being contented with having disgraced one female, he made an attempt upon others and by the same plausible tale, overcame them also. It was a fact that Bennett had a wife and children living and that she had left him because of his ill treatment towards her. The letter was read to Bennett, which he did not attempt to deny, but candidly acknowledged the fact. Dr. Bennett made an attempt at suicide by taking poison. Um, without any government over his passions, he was soon busily engaged in the same wicked career and continued until the knowledge of the same reached my ears. I publicly proclaimed against it. I had uh, those females notified to appear before the proper officers that the whole subject might be investigated and thoroughly exposed. And it was. And uh, it goes on. John Bennett signed an affidavit. It says, John C. Bennett, who being duly sworn according to law, deposeth and saith that he never was taught anything in the least contrary to the strictest principles of the gospel or of virtue or the laws of God or man under any circumstances or upon any occasion, either directly or indirectly in word or deed by Joseph Smith, that he never knew the said Smith to countenance any improper conduct whatever, either in public or private, and that he never did teach me in private that an illegal, illicit intercourse with females was under any circumstances justifiable, and that I never knew him to teach others. John Bennett, sworn to under oath 
in an affidavit. Then the members of the city council in this same edition of the Times and Seasons also sign an affidavit saying, I publicly avow that anyone who has said that I, this is them quoting Dr. Bennett in his testimony when he came before them, quoting him. I publicly avow that anyone who has said that I, John Bennett, have stated that General Joseph Smith has given me authority to hold illicit intercourse with women is a liar in the face of God. Those who have said it are damned liars and are infernal liars. He never either in public or private gave me any such authority or license or any person, and any person who says it is a scoundrel and a liar. Um, Joseph asked him in front of the council, will you please state definitely whether you know anything against my character, either in public or in private? General Bennett answered, I do not. In all my intercourse with General Smith, in private and in public, he has been entirely virtuous. Then there are affidavits that are signed by George Miller, um, the subject gets taken up again almost the entire edition of the August 1st. Um, um, Times and Seasons contains more affidavits, more public statements, uh, more acknowledgments, and this time William Law goes on the record, and William Law um, testifies in an affidavit that's really quite striking in defending the character of Joseph and in condemning what uh, John Bennett attributed to him. If you go to the Nauvoo City uh, and High Council minutes and you look at the trials that went on in um, connection with this, you find out that um, three days previous to May 14th of 1842, Bennett resigned his mayoral post um, because he had been accused of adultery, fornication, buggery, and miscagenation. Buggery was the euphemism used in that time for homosexual relations. Miscagenation was the legal um, status of a white person having intercourse with a black person because that was mixing the, the races. And so he was accused of those things according to a newspaper um, account at the time. Um, so when you get to the um, minutes of the trial before the um, um, council on July 20th of 1842, John C. Bennett was not under duress at the time he testified before the city council, May 19th, 1842, concerning Joseph Smith's innocence and virtue and pure teaching. There was no excitement at the time, nor was he in any wise threatened, menaced, or intimidated. His appearance at the city council was voluntary. Joseph Smith asked him if he knew anything bad concerning his public or private character. He then delivered those statements contained in the testimony voluntarily and of his own free will and went on his own record as free as any member of the council. And that signed in that setting by both uh, William Law, or excuse me, Wilson Law, William Law, and William Marks. Um, well, in the fallout from that, charges were preferred um, as they tracked down what had been going on in Nauvoo. And by May 21st of 1842, the High Council met uh, a charge was preferred against Chauncey Higby by George Miller for unchaste and unvirtuous conduct with the widow Sarah Miller and others. Three witnesses testified he had seduced several women and at different times had been guilty of unchaste and unvirtuous conduct with them and taught the doctrine that it was right to have free intercourse with women if it was kept secret and so on, and also taught that Joseph Smith authorized him to practice these things and so on. On May 25th, a charge was preferred against Miss Cas Catherine Warren by George Miller for unchaste and unvirtuous conduct with John C. Bennett and others. The defendant confessed to the charge 
and gave the names of several other men who had been guilty of having unlawful intercourse with her, stating they taught the doctrine that it was right to have free intercourse with women and that the heads of the church also taught and practiced it. Um, learning that the heads of the church did not believe in the practice of such things, she was willing to confess her sins and did repent before God for what she had done and desired earnestly that the council would forgive her. She furnished names. And then September of 1840, September 3rd of 1842, a charge was preferred against Gustavus Hill by Elijah Everett, one of the teachers of the church, for illicit intercourse with a certain woman by the name of Mary Clift, by which she was with child and for teaching the said Mary Clift that the heads of the church practiced such doctrine and that time would come when men would have more wives than one and so on. Uh, Esther Smith gave evidence that the defendant told her it was lawful for people to have illicit intercourse if they only held their peace. It was agreeable to the practice of some of the leading uh, men or heads of the church. Then another court is held on August uh, the 12th of 1842. Um, and I'm not going to bother reading um, more of the charges. You get the idea. They round up a significant number of people that are involved in this practice. So, John Bennett, then, in response to the treatment that he received by the church, sets out to tell another story. I'm reading now from John Bennett's book, uh, The History of the Saints, or an expose of Joe Smith and Mormonism. I was at least for some time a convert to their pretended religion. This, however, is a very grievous error. I mean, he's saying that he's been accused of being a member of the church, but it's an error to think of him in that way. I never believed in them or their doctrines. This is and was indeed from the first well known to my friends and acquaintances in the Western country who were well aware of my reasons for connecting myself with the prophet, which reasons I will now proceed to state. He writes, It at length occurred to me that the surest and speediest way to overthrow the imposter and expose his iniquity to the world would be to profess myself a convert to his doctrines and to join him at the seat of the dominion. The course I was resolved to pursue would enable me to get behind the curtain and behold at my leisure the secret wires and fabric and likewise those who moved them. And then he addresses the obvious problem that should present itself to any one of us. Why would we believe a liar on any subject when he's telling us that he lied in order to get there? What confidence can I place in your statements when I know by your own confessions that you've once played the part of the hypocrite? And he answers that. Suppose that by going among them and professing to be their friends, I could find out something that will help deter the evil that they have in mind, then isn't it worth lying to get in there and uh, doing so? And he explains that he's really telling the truth this time in this book, even though he admits in this book lying to the Mormons to get their confidence, that was a necessary lie in order to be able to furnish you with the truth. Well, he goes on to explain the system that he attributes to Joseph Smith. Now, I don't believe that John Bennett, having invented the system that persuaded a number of people to participate in this sexual licentiousness in Nauvoo, would invent still another system to talk about in his book. I think the system that he describes in this book is actually what he was preaching. He has three orders of women from the Relief Society. The Cyprian Saints, this is the first order. It's the lowest order. She takes the white veil. Her names and failing are stealthily promulgated among the trustworthy members of the church at whose command she is for licentious purposes forever after. So the lowest order is the Cyprian saints, and she's disgraced, and she just gets to be used. But, but it's given um, uh, the white veil. 
The next higher order is the chambered sisters of charity. Whenever one of these saints, as the Mormon style themselves, of the male sex becomes enamored of a female and she responds to the feeling by a reciprocal manifestation, the loving brother goes to Holy Joe and states the case. It makes by the by no difference whatever if one or both parties are already provided with conjungal helpmates, the prophet gravely buries his face in a hat in which lies his peepstone and inquires the Lord uh, what are his will and pleasure in the matter. Generally, the reply permits the parties to follow the bent of their inclinations, which they do without further ceremony, though with a strict observance of secrecy on account of the Gentiles who have no right to the blessings and privileges so liberally granted the Latter-day Saints. The chambered secrets of, or sisters of charity are the saints of the green veil. So he's got three orders. And when you finally get to the highest order, these are the consecrates of the cloister or cloistered saints. Um, they're by express grant a gift of God through the, his prophet, Holy Joe, set apart and consecrated to the use and benefit of particular individuals as secret spiritual wives. They are the saints of the black veil and are accounted the special favorites of heaven. Their spiritual husbands are all together from the most eminent members of the Mormon church, whether an apostle, high priest, elder, or scribe conceives um, an affection and then he goes on to describe you know, the licentiousness and um, wickedness of Mormons. Those who have grappled with the subject of polygamy, looking back at Joseph Smith, do so through this lens. He devotes a considerable effort in this book to attribute to Joseph Smith improprieties with Sarah Pratt while uh, Orson Pratt was on a mission to England. John Bennett says that while Orson Pratt was on a mission, that Joseph Smith approached Sarah Pratt and that uh, Joseph solicited Sarah to be a plural wife of his and that he compromised her. There is another story that got told at the time. That other story was that Sarah... Pratt was one of John Bennett's conquests and that she did, in fact, prove to be unfaithful to Orson while on a mission, but that she had been unfaithful not with Joseph Smith, but with John Bennett. Sarah Pratt was a, um, a loyal wife to Orson, a... Um, active member of the church and a faithful member, and she appeared to support everything that was going on until um, Orson Pratt decided that instead of giving his primary time to her, that he was then going to divide his time equally among six wives and that she would only receive one-sixth of his time. That was too far for her. And Sarah Pratt divorced Orson. She uh, apostatized from Mormonism, and she became the founder of the Anti-Polygamy Society in Salt Lake City. However, before she left the church and became an enemy to plural marriage, she had a correspondence with Joseph Smith III. Joseph Smith III wanted to know about his father. And he obviously knew about what John Bennett had said about Joseph compromising Sarah Pratt. So Joseph Smith III, the son of Joseph Smith, wanted to know from Sarah what was going on. She answered his questions. She died, and in the Saints Herald, a newspaper that was printed by the 
Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith published this account. These are the um, questions. Did he ever at such times or at any other time or place make improper overtures to you or proposals of an improper nature, begging your pardon for the apparent indelicacy of this question? To this, Mrs. Pratt replied quietly but firmly, no, Joseph, your father, never said an improper word to me in his life. He knew better. Sister Pratt, it has been frequently told that he behaved improperly in your presence. And I have been told that I dare not come to you and ask you about your relations with him for fear you would tell me things which would be unwelcome to me. You need have no such fear, she repeated. Your father was never guilty of an action or proposal of an improper nature in my house toward me or in my presence at any time or place. There is no truth in the reports that have been circulated about him in this regard. He was always the Christian gentleman and a noble man. Later, after she's disaffected, she adopts John Bennett's accusations. Later, she tells a completely contrary story. And just as John Bennett says that he was a liar at one point, but he's telling the truth now, Sarah Pratt adopts his version of the events, and there are many people who, because of the integrity with which she had lived her life before, once she decided to tell the contrary story, accepts her story and does something with that. She founded the Anti-Polygamy Society. She was an enemy to the perpetuation of polygamy. She was saying what she needed to do to try and end the order. She had been hurt by the actions of her husband. When people have an agenda, you have to realize that that's going to color what goes on. So you have the interpreted problem of John Bennett. The second big problem that we have is that Joseph Smith was dead in 1844, and in 1852, the um, public was told, we do this stuff. So beginning in 1852, the, um, the Mormons decide that they're going to, uh, they're going to publicly advocate it. Um, Orson Pratt, the husband of um, Sarah Pratt, moves to Washington, D.C. to advocate for the acceptance of polygamy in the nation's capital. Orson Pratt is the one who was asked to get up and give the talk. Orson Pratt's talk is preserved in the Journal of Discourses. Brigham Young spoke immediately after Orson Pratt, and he added this to the story. The revelations will be read to you. The principle spoken upon by Brother Pratt this morning, we believe in. And I tell you, for I know it, it will sail over and ride triumphantly above all the prejudice and priestcraft of the day. It will be fostered and believed in by the more intelligent portions of the world as one of the best doctrines ever proclaimed to any people. Your hearts need not beat. You need not think that a mob is coming here to tread upon the sacred liberty which the Constitution of our country guarantees for us, for it will not be. The world had known long ago, even in Brother Joseph's day, that he had more wives than one. One of the senators in Congress knew it very well. Did he oppose it? No, but he has been our friend all the day long, especially upon that subject. He said pointedly to his friends, if the United States do not adopt that very method, let them continue on as they are now, pursue the precise course that they are now pursuing, and it will come to this that their generations will not live until they are 30 years old. They are going to destruction. Disease is spreading so fast among the inhabitants of the United States that they are born rotten with it, and in a few years they are gone. Says he, Joseph has introduced the best plan for restoring and establishing strength 
and long life among men of any man on earth, and the Mormons are very good and virtuous people. Many others are of the same mind. They are not ignorant of what we are doing and our social capacity. They've cried, proclaim it. But it would not do a few years ago. Anything must come in time. As there is a time to all things, I am now ready to proclaim it. So, <clears throat> interpreting that, while they were still in Illinois, Stephen A. Douglas, a senator, he was not a senator at the time, he became a senator after he was a senator at the time of this talk by Brigham Young. Stephen A. Douglas, senator in the United States, encouraged them to go public with polygamy because everyone would see the common sense of it. The health, the people dying, the people being born, that was venereal disease. He was saying, yeah, if they could marry more women, then they wouldn't catch venereal disease with the prostitutes. So it will contribute to public hygiene if we can get rid of all of the prostitution by making wives of the women. This is the thinking of Stephen A. Douglas, commended to Brigham Young, repeated by Brigham Young in the, on the day in which the announcement was made. Okay? Both the talk <coughs> given by Orson Pratt and the seconding made by Brigham Young says the Constitution. The Constitution protects it. Orson Pratt went to Washington, D.C., and he founded a newspaper that was called The Seer. In The Seer, he says, the doctrine of celestial marriage or marriage for all eternity as believed and practiced by the saints in Utah Territory will be clearly explained. The views of the saints in regard to the ancient patriarchal order of matrimony or plurality of wives as developed in a revelation given through Joseph Smith, the seer, seer will be fully published. That's the purpose of this newspaper. It is hoped that the president-elect, the honorable members of Congress, the heads of the various departments of the national government, the high-minded governors and legislative assemblies of the several states and territories, the ministers of every religious denomination, and all the inhabitants of this great republic will patronize this periodical that through the medium of our own writing they may be more correctly and fully informed in regard to the peculiar doctrines, views, practices, and expectations of the saints who now flourish in the mountain territory. Orson Pratt. December 21, 1852, in Washington, D.C., where the seer was published, and it went on in publication from 1852 thereafter for a number of years. All of those have been gathered now into a single volume that is published in a book called The Seer. I don't know if it's still in print, but um, in there he, uh, he advocates it, and in the first edition published following the announcement, says the Constitution and laws of the United States being founded upon the principles of freedom allow for the practice of plurality of lives. And he makes his constitutional argument in the first uh, volume of it. It was important to uh, protecting the ability to practice it. It was important for them to establish as a matter of public practice that they did it and that it was an integral and important part of the religion. If it was not a fundamental part of the religion, the First Amendment would not protect it. Therefore, beginning in 1852, in order to practice it and in order to win the anticipated legal argument, it was necessary to advocate for it in a way that was wholly beyond anything that Joseph Smith had ever said or done. But for the next 38 years in public, what the leadership of the church did every time they were given an opportunity to do so was to emphasize that plural wives was an essential part of the religion because they knew if it was not so regarded, then it could not be constitutionally protected. This is another distortion in the lens of trying to figure out what Joseph was up to. If you take what was said during that 38-year time period and you say that is exactly what Joseph Smith meant, you're going to reach a conclusion about what Joseph Smith meant that should not be attributed to him. 
You can attribute it to Brigham Young. You can attribute it to Stephen A. Douglas. You can certainly say you know what Orson Pratt thinks about plural marriage. You can say all of that. But what you cannot say is that they knew what Joseph was doing. They can't do that. Well, a great deal more could be said about all of that. But I want to keep this to a reasonable time period, and I want to ask the question, what was Joseph really trying to accomplish? Um, briefly, by the time you get to 1890 and the manifesto, what the manifesto did, I think only makes it more difficult for uh, an understanding of what Joseph Smith was up to. Uh, the 1890 manifesto was not mirrored in LDS conduct. The 1890 manifesto was a public relations press announcement saying that they were taking down the endowment house and that the president of the church was going to use his influence to discourage the continued practice of polygamy, but polygamy continued. Polygamy and plural marriages did not end. And what happened with the manifesto actually serves the, the purpose of persuading the fundamentalists that it needed to continue, even if you have to go once again underground, and even if you have to lie, cheat, steal, and deceive, even if you've got to avoid the law, you still need to honor and practice it. There is a um, seven-volume history of plural marriage that's been assembled by a, um, a polygamist, Arnold Boss, in which he walks through the, the history of what went on. Most of the information that, that he has assembled in his seven volumes of the history deals with the fact that, um, that there was more to polygamy than people knew about before it was announced publicly in 1852. And there was a whole lot more to the continuation of the practice after 1890. The formal LDS church organization continued to practice plural marriage and to marry additional wives after 1890, including at least one church president and members of the First Presidency and the Twelve from 1890 until a second manifesto in 1904 during the Reed Smoot Senate confirmation hearings in which, as a witness, Joseph F. Smith was summoned to Congress, sworn under oath, and then interrogated by a congressional committee in which he was asked about the, um, uh, the practice of plural marriage, among many other things. Uh, I have a transcript of that here, too, and, and those are useful and good reading. He denies that it was going on, but he returned and then sent out a second manifesto to make sure that what he testified to under oath was, in fact, true. And therefore, he ended it because he was cornered. If you read the diaries and you read the journals of those that were directly involved during the time that the manifesto was going on, and I've got a number of those, but we don't have the time to read all the excerpts. The fact is that when the manifesto was adopted, it was adopted really as a ruse. And when um, uh, the testimony was required by the special master, uh, Wilfred Woodruff was given, Woodruff went far beyond where he thought he was going to go before he went in there. They had a game plan going in. And the, the um, uh, special master in the, uh, before the magistrate judge in the federal district court didn't give him any wiggle room. So they were, they were caught, and they had to abandon plural marriage. But the way that they abandoned it was a ruse, and it remained a ruse until 1904. And in 1904, uh, uh, Joseph F. Smith sent out a second manifesto when two of the members of the Twelve were later caught by the Salt Lake Tribune in continuing the practice. The two of them were excommunicated. Well, one of them was excommunicated. Both of them lost their positions in the Quorum of the Twelve. And um, that uh, 
signaled essentially the end. But if you want to know whether or not it continued thereafter, then there are commentaries that will relate to you the history. Um, another source of material about the continuation of practice is the, um, the um, collected works of Ogden Kraut. His son Kevin Kraut has given me the first four volumes, the first five volumes. It's anticipated it'll be seven in total. But what the fundamentalists do is that they come and they tell you about the history that the LDS Church denies. And they make it seem as though there is more to the requirement of plural marriage than there ever was. Um, but they have a lot of history that, that we deny. Um, the continuing splendor groups, including Arnold Boss's works, uh, Ogden Kraut's works, and others that are out there working to preserve the fundamentalist polygamy practice, have done a job of defending the practice using material that is authentic, that is real, and that justifies the, um, uh, the practice. All of which, when you put it together, doesn't help understand what Joseph Smith was doing or why. Okay? You can take all of that stuff from John Bennett. You can take everything that has been said, written, preached. You can take the entirety of The Seer by Orson Pratt. You can read and study it all, and it still doesn't tell you what Joseph Smith was doing or why. I read you the statement from uh, Hales. The women that were involved didn't tell you anything, and Joseph told you nothing. And what you're left with at the end of all this is section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is not an easy section to understand. I went to some effort in uh, passing the heavenly gift to show that it is actually not one revelation, but several, and that the exalting eternal principle of marriage is dealt with in the first part of the revelation in which it talks about marriage between a man and a wife, singular, a wife. The revelation is about the eternal, eternal nature of the marriage covenant, which exalts. And then secondarily, it answers the question about what happened with David and Solomon and Abraham and these others that had many wives. And then it lists the extremely narrow criteria in which that's permitted. Okay? We don't have any proof that Joseph Smith had sexual relations with any woman other than Emma Smith. He didn't produce children with anyone other than, um, than her. Uh, Navu Navuan, Eliza Jane Churchill Webb, wrote in 1876, Joseph never had any living children by his polygamous women, unquote. When asked on November 1, 1879, quote, why did Joseph Smith the prophet have no children, unquote, Joseph F. Smith responded, quote, because it would have been against him in the law of the state against bigamy, the children would have been proven to be his, or the mothers would have been condemned for illicit intercourse. Polygamous marriages were not being considered legitimate marriages, unquote. Joseph F. Smith says he didn't have children. You could not have intercourse before Griswold versus Connecticut without risking having children. Therefore, what Joseph Smith was doing with plural marriage may be something altogether different. If you're going to try and understand what that was about, you're going to have to throw away everything you think you understand about plural marriage and allow some things from the scriptures to penetrate. Joseph Smith was 
doing something which did not just put together a man and a wife. He was doing something that put together families. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a mock-up of a family. It is a mock-up of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the first presidency and the 12 sons of Jacob in the Quorum of the Twelve and the 70 descendants that went into Egypt when they migrated into Egypt when Joseph was counselor to Pharaoh that you can read in Exodus chapter 1, verse 5. That's the church. It is a mock-up. It is an imitation. It is a facsimile of the family of Abraham. It is not the family of Abraham. But it is a powerful evidence that the family of Abraham is in fact something Joseph Smith was interested in restoring. Eventually that which is a mockery is going to give way to that which is the family. First you have a schoolmaster and then you have the reality. Joseph was headed to the reality, but he didn't get there in his day. In the, um, in the immediate aftermath of Joseph's death and the completion of the Nauvoo Temple, um, there was a lot of questions that could not, could not then be answered because they simply no longer had the keys with which to get the answers to the questions that were pressing upon them. If they didn't have the ability to ask and get an answer, then they couldn't get direction. And they couldn't. Therefore, what Joseph was doing was left without a culmination. You can go out, and there is physical proof in the restored Nauvoo Temple. You can see this on the uh, website uh, where the photograph was taken and put up, uh, Bear Record, um, where there's a place where the brick size changes in the construction of the Nauvoo Temple. They were making small bricks, and you can see how far up the small bricks run on the outside of the temple. When Joseph was killed, in order to complete the temple in greater haste, the size of the bricks increase. And so there's a point at which the size of the bricks go from small to larger when they're hastening the work in which they're trying to get the building done. The level at which the temple had been completed at the time of the martyrdom essentially was a repetition of what had been built in the Kirtland Temple. It is the solemn assembly room, okay? Joseph never lived to tell anyone how to build the top of the Nauvoo Temple. So when they got to the point that they were finishing the Nauvoo Temple, they didn't have any plans for what happened in the attic area other than the rooms around the perimeter in which the priesthood was supposed to meet. And so to create the ceremonial setting in which the Nauvoo Temple endowment companies were taken through, they took canvas that Joseph had ordered for a bowery so they could get it out of the weather, and they took the canvas and they made partitions in the attic area to divide the rooms up in which to present the endowment in the attic of the, Kirtland, or of the Nauvoo Temple. Had Joseph lived, he would have been able to finish out that space. He didn't live, and so they did it with canvas, they did it as a temporary thing, and they, um, they administered the endowments in that setting. In the process of administering those things, there was something that went on that they were trying to imitate what Joseph had been talking about. And Brigham Young makes an explanation shortly after they abandoned. I mean, the same month that they abandoned Nauvoo and they're heading west, uh, he gives a talk in winter quarters in February of 1847. This is the 16th of February. They walked out of town on the 9th. So this is a week later. He's talking about a subject that really defines what the 
um, entirety of this topic is really involved with. The Lord introduced the law of adoption for the benefit of the children of men as a schoolmaster to bring them back to the covenant of the priesthood, not as some have supposed to add anything to his glory. This principle, I answer, is not clearly understood by many of the elders in this church at the present time as it will hereafter. And I confess that I have only had a smattering of these things. But when it is necessary, I will attain to more knowledge on this subject and consequently will be entitled to teach and practice more and will, in the meantime, glorify God, the bountiful giver. Um, the rest of that talk's interesting and I would comment on it, but, but we don't have time. So this is on the 16th of February. On the 23rd, another week later, Brigham Young gives another talk. And this talk is, is pointed to, for one purpose, I want to read you a more fulsome account and suggest to you the more important purpose. Okay? This is that great occasion on which Brigham Young went to sleep and had a dream in which Joseph Smith appeared to him. And Joseph Smith, well, let me read you the account. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm into the part where he's already introduced that he's dreaming, that he's seen Joseph, and that Joseph is now talking to him. I then discovered there was a handrail between us. Joseph stood by a window in the southwest of him. It was very light. I was in the twilight, and to the north of me, it was very dark. Joseph's in the light. Brigham's in the dark. I said, Brother Joseph, the brethren you know well better than I do. You raised them up and brought the priesthood to us. The brethren have a great anxiety to understand the law of adoption or sealing principles. And if you have a word of counsel for me, I should be glad to receive it. So now of all the things about which Brigham Young could be talking to the prophet Joseph Smith on this occasion, the thing that comes thundering to the foreground that he would like to know about is the law of adoption. He wants to know that, standing as he is in the dark. Joseph stepped toward me and looking very earnestly yet pleasantly said, tell the people to, hum to be humble and faithful. Be sure to keep the spirit of the Lord. It will lead them right. Be careful and not turn away the small voice. It will teach you what to do and where to go. It will yield the fruits of the kingdom. Tell the brethren to keep their hearts open to conviction so that when the Holy Ghost comes to them, their hearts will be ready to receive it. They can tell the spirit of the Lord from all other spirits. It will whisper peace and joy to their souls. It will take malice, hatred, strife, and all evil from their hearts. And their whole desire will be to do good, bring forth righteousness, and build up the kingdom of God. Tell the brethren if they will follow the spirit of the Lord, they will go right. Be sure to tell the people to keep the spirit of the Lord. And if they will, they will find themselves just as they were organized by our Father in heaven before they came into the world. Our Father in heaven organized the human family, but they are all disorganized and in great uh, confusion. Um, and so Joseph's answer to the pressing question of how do we go about getting these ceilings right is to say, oh, go get the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Ghost guide you. God will get you organized. In other words, Joseph punted on the answer. It would do no good for the answer to be given if the authority with which to administer the answer was something that wasn't there. Therefore, rather than to tell him so that some solemn mockery continued, it was time to bring it to an end. And although they made an effort to continue in that vein for a short while, as I pointed out in passing the heavenly gift, everyone talked about they didn't understand it. And in fact, some of the leading brethren said, I didn't believe it when I first heard it, and I don't believe it now. And the practice of adoption came to an end. Okay? 
But I want to go back for a moment to what we do know from Doctrine and Covenants section 132 that comes from the prophet Joseph Smith because that's it. That's the entirety of what we have from him. And in verse 7 of this section 132, it says, I, um, I have appointed on the earth to hold this power, and I have appointed unto my servant Joseph to hold this power in the last days, and there is never but one on the earth at a time on whom this power and the keys of this priesthood are conferred, and so on. There is only one. Only one. So, when we go to Doctrine and Covenants section 107, it talks about the order of this priesthood, I'm reading from verse 40, was confirmed to be handed down from father to son and rightly belongs to the literal descendants of the chosen seed to whom the promises were made. This order was instituted in the days of Adam and it came down by lineage in the following manner. From Adam to Seth, who was ordained by Adam at the age of 69 years and blessed by him three years previous to his, Adam's death, and received the promise of God by his father that his posterity should be the chosen of the Lord and that they should be preserved unto the end of the earth. Because he, Seth, was a perfect man, and his likeness was the express likeness of his father, insomuch that he seemed to be likened to his father in all things and could be distinguished from him only by his age. Enos was ordained at the age of 134 years and four months by the hand of Adam. God called upon Canaan in the wilderness in the 40th year of his age, and he met Adam in his journeying to the place of Shadonamach. He was 87 years old when he received his ordination. Mahaliel was 496 years and seven days when he was ordained by the hand of Adam. Jared was 200 years old when he was ordained under the hand of Adam. Enoch was 25 years old when he was ordained of Adam. Methuselah was 100 years old when he was ordained. Lamech was 32. Noah was 10 when he was ordained under the hand of Methuselah. Three years previous to the death of Adam, he called Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah, who were all high priests, with the residue of his posterity who were righteous, into the valley of Adam on Diom, and there bestowed upon them his last blessing, and so on. When you go to the story in Moses chapter 5 and you read about um, Adam and Eve and their posterity, Adam and Eve have children and the children are seduced by uh, Satan and persuaded to be led astray. Then they have a son to whom the birthright was going to be granted because he appeared to be interested in the things of God so much so that he was willing to offer sacrifice. That son, the older one, was named Cain. And the next son born was Abel. But Abel was more attentive to the things of God. Both Cain and Abel offered sacrifices to the Lord. However, the Lord approved the sacrifice of Abel. At this point in the history of man, if that rite of priesthood passed from Adam to Abel, it would have displaced Cain. Cain sought for the right whereunto he would be the one to hold that priesthood. He was the one who wanted it. And the first murder that was committed was committed against the one who would inherit the birthright. Done precisely for the purpose of eliminating the posterity of Abel. So that Abel, having no posterity, could not be the one through whom 
the birthright would be perpetuated. When Cain sought to take what God had instead appointed his younger brother to receive, Cain was deprived of the right of priesthood. And it passed over him and his descendants so that Cain did not obtain the birthright. And Eve conceived, and she bore a replacement son, and that son, Seth, became the one through whom the promises would be given. And Cain was driven out from the people. Now you have to understand that This is in Moses chapter six. Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his own image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat many sons and daughters. Adam begat many sons and daughters. But the son named Seth was the one to whom this priesthood went because there is only one appointed. Seth lived 105 years and he begat Enos and prophesied in all his days and taught his son Enos in the ways of God. Wherefore, Enos prophesied also. And Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years and begat many sons and daughters. So Seth begat Enos and many sons and daughters. But the right of the lineage and the priesthood went from Adam to Seth to Enos. This is a description of that priesthood which was briefly restored in one person, Joseph, to be given to Hiram, because it goes to the oldest righteous descendant. And when it was restored through Joseph Smith, Hiram was not yet qualified. But when Hiram became qualified, by January of 1841, In the revelation given then, Hiram is the one to whom the birthright went, being the eldest and being the one who was qualified. This is why it was necessary for Hiram to die before Joseph so that in this dispensation Joseph and Hiram can stand at the head because if Hiram had not died first but Joseph had died first Joseph would have died without having had the passing well Notice that Seth had many sons and daughters. And then you get to the next, Enos. He lived um, and begat Canaan. Enos um, also has many sons and daughters, but Canaan was the one upon whom the birthright. And this follows all the way down, all the way down. You can read it in Moses chapter six, how it descends through the line. This pattern repeats over and over again. As I'm talking about this, I'm making reference to a diagram that appeared first in the Millennial Star on January the 15th of 1847, but which you can see in the um, Joseph Smith papers on page 298, uh, where they reproduce the, uh, the same diagram 
of, um, of the kingdom of God. The only difference being that I have filled in the names on this chart so that you can see where the names go. Now, we get to the point in the history of the world in which after the days of Shem, who was renamed Melchizedek, people fell into iniquity. They fell into iniquity and they lost the birthright. There was no continuation of this. It was broken by an apostasy and it had to be restored again, which ought to give all of us great hope because... Abraham sought for this. He sought for a restoration of the kingdom of God. He sought for a restoration of this, which only one man on the earth can hold at a time. Abraham chapter 1, verse 2. Finding there was greater happiness and peace and rest for me, I sought for the blessings of the fathers and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same having been myself a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge and to be a greater follower of righteousness and possess a greater knowledge and to be a father of many nations. A prince of peace, desiring to receive instructions and keep the commandments of God. I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the right belonging to the fathers. When you are in possession of that, you have no problem asking God and getting an answer. It is the right belonging to the fathers. After a period of apostasy and the break of this line, Abraham received it by adoption. Therefore, this power has the ability to cure the break. This covenant making through God has the ability to restore the family of God even when wicked men kill in order to destroy it. Even when a substitute needs to be made, even when the fathers turn from their righteousness, yet God is able to cause it to persist. And Joseph Smith was doing something which no one else either understood or had the right to perpetuate. This continued through 10 generations from um, Adam to Melchizedek, but through Abraham it continued five generations. And it appeared again once on the earth in a single generation that included Joseph and his brother Hiram. Now even the mockery of it has come to an end because there is no such thing as a perpetuation in honorable mention of the descendants of Hiram Smith in the office of patriarch in the church. There have been many signs that have been given by God that he was about to do something new from the time of the death of Joseph Smith till today. All that was left at the end was for a witness to be appointed to come and to say it now has come to an end. In the last talk that I gave, in the 10 lecture series, I said, a witness has now come and I'm him. It has come to an end. One of the signs of it having come to an end was the passing of Albert Smith. There are many other signs that have been given if you're looking for them. You can see them all along the line. The church, Emma Smith once said that without Joseph Smith, there is no church. And you know what? Emma Smith was right. Because as soon as you remove Joseph Smith out of the picture, what you had essentially was a complete overthrow of the church by the Quorum of the Twelve. The Quorum of the Twelve substituted themselves in the place. The first presidency under Joseph Smith was a quorum 
that the Quorum of the Twelve may be equal in authority to, but there was never a single apostle taken out of the Quorum of the Twelve, moved into the First Presidency by Joseph Smith. These were two independently existing bodies. The Quorum of the Twelve did not occupy the First Presidency, and the First Presidency filled itself without regard to the Twelve. Similarly, the Quorum of the Seventy formed a quorum equal in authority with the Quorum of the Twelve, and therefore with the First Presidency also. <coughs> None of this survived Brigham Young. None of this survived Brigham Young. The high councils of Zion, the standing high councils, formed a quorum equal in authority with the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve. All of the keys to rule in Israel, 100% First Presidency, 100% Quorum of the Twelve, 100% Quorum of the Seventy, 100% in the High Councils. After Brigham Young took over, that was destroyed, and it became an oligarchy in which the Quorum of the Twelve runs everything, even through today. But they don't run this, and they can't run this, and for this, God alone is in charge. There is more to, there's more to this than you can even begin to imagine. In the last revelation I received on this subject, I recorded, it has puzzled me how the Lord could go to visit the dead. The dead could greet the Son of God in the Spirit, where he, quote, declared their redemption from the bands of death. Their sleeping dust was to be restored unto its perfect frame, bone to his bone, and the sinews and flesh upon it the spirit and the body to be united, never again to be divided, that they might receive a fullness of joy, unquote, DNC 138, 16 to 17. On the one hand, but Christ did not go to preach to the wicked. Instead, quote, from among the righteous, he organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority, and commissioned them to go forth, unquote. Therefore, the very same spirits who rejoiced at the deliverance from the grave were left in the grave, and it was by them, quote, was the gospel preached to those who had died, unquote. DNC 138, 30 to 32. I have wondered how they could be raised from the dead and remain yet to preach to the dead. After inquiring about this matter diligently, I have learned that when the Lord declared the resurrection, he did not resurrect them. He assured them it would come. But comparatively few were resurrected with the Lord at the time he came forth from the grave. This then puzzled me to know who then was taken from the grave, as reported in Matthew 27, 52, quote, many bodies of the saints which slept arose, unquote, and prophesied by Samuel and confirmed by Christ, 3 Nephi 23, 9 to 13. Who arose? that were called many saints by both the New Testament and Book of Mormon. I was shown that the spirits that rose were limited to a direct line back to Adam, requiring the hearts of the fathers and the hearts of the children to be bound together by sealing, confirmed by covenant, and the Holy Spirit of promise. 
This is the reason Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, quote, have entered into their exaltation according to the promises and sit upon thrones that are not angels but are gods, unquote, DNC 132, 37. The coming of the Lord in the future will not bring an immediate resurrection, just as the res resurrection of Christ did not empty the world of spirits of even the righteous dead. Those who will be prepared at his coming will remain comparatively few still. Hence, the great need to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children, and this too by covenant and sealing through the Holy Spirit of promise. It was abundantly clear, according to Joseph, that the only way in which this kind of a welding link could be accomplished required a temple to be built. And not the temple that was built in Kirtland that was accepted by the Lord, but something different. There are at least three stages in the process of restoring knowledge. The first stage is to receive it. But that's just receiving it. Receiving it is not the same thing as the second stage, which is to comprehend it. It is possible that a man receives something without understanding what it was that he had received. Time and careful and solemn and ponderous thoughts are required to untangle what has been received in order to comprehend what it is that you have been given. But it is altogether something of a different order of magnitude, completely separate from that, to teach it. You can receive it, you can comprehend it, but you may not be able to teach it. When it finally does get taught, undoubtedly it will be taught in the manner that Joseph Smith was beginning to work on in Nauvoo that he never finished at the time that he was taken. That is, by ceremony, by covenant, and this too by something given by God and it to be established in a house that is acceptable to him. If you want to know what Joseph Smith was doing in his efforts, apart from the church, in a whole new effort, talking about something involving potentially the plurality of wives, you have to understand the birthright, you have to understand the sealing power, you have to understand he was trying to organize again on the earth the kingdom of God. He was trying to bring back the actual family. But he was taken from us at the incipient stage because all that he was sent here to do was to lay a groundwork, to lay the beginning, to come as an Elias, to come and to call to the world and to give to them if they will pay attention to it, a basis upon which they can study and learn and potentially qualify for the Lord to resume the restoration and bring it to a completion. All of the work that gets done for the dead, where you seal yourself to your ancestors like they're going to get you anywhere, is the inverse of the model that Joseph was establishing. Joseph had people sealed to him because he had formed a link to heaven. Sealing your kindred dead to be your superior puts you in the spirit world, living among the dead, unredeemed, unresurrected, unreturned to the flesh, where you, like your kindred righteous dead, can preach to the people that are in prison but it'll never get you up Jacob's ladder back to the presence of God. It won't even get you out of the grave. If you're going to be part of the family of God, there has to be a link, and the link has to form 
in an unbroken chain. Joseph was doing something very different than what became essentially a, um, a vast wasteland of adulterous relationships, unapproved by God, unsanctioned by him, unmeriting preservation, and essentially hedging up the kingdom of God. I know that there were men who received blessings under the hands of Joseph and that Joseph held the priesthood and that those people had blessings bestowed upon them by the authority that Joseph held. They had blessings of the priesthood, even if they didn't hold it. He blessed them. And I know that Wilfred Woodruff received a revelation that, that insisted on the continuation of celestial marriage. And so too, the 1886 revelation that John Taylor talks about, he will never revoke the commandment to practice celestial marriage. But what is celestial marriage? It's the first 33 verses of section 132. That's where a man and a woman are sealed together for eternity. The practice of polygamy was never authorized and the way in which it was taught was not proper. And Joseph Smith restored a covenant by which a family could be restored that belonged to God. He did not do it for the reasons that Brigham Young practiced it. What was done was an error and the perpetuation of it is an error. And those who are in polygamy who are now being baptized and coming out of it need to end the practice with them. I do not think it is pleasing to God to tear a family apart. Therefore, no one should be abandoning the responsibility as parents of children or as members of a household. But the children in those families need to be taught that this is not pleasing to God, that it must end in this generation. Because the time to end the error has come. If we don't end the error, how can we possibly expect that God will be pleased enough with us to restore the covenant, to allow the connection that needs to be made back to the fathers? Well, a lot more can be said. But I hope that what has been said is enough to point you in a new direction. Because what God is about to do can include a return of that work that Joseph and Hiram got to. But it will not happen if we go charging out, attempting to hasten what is so deadly a proposition that aspiring men at the beginning of the world murdered in order to interfere with it. There is no reason to charge into that path and be destroyed by the beast that waits there. The best we can and should do is wait patiently and prayerfully on God and allow him to determine when we are prepared to receive what he has said so many times. He would gather us as chicks under the wings of the hen if we would but respond. Part of responding to him is to allow him to do his work in his way, in his time, by his means. I bear testimony to you that Joseph Smith was not a wicked man. He was a prophet of God. He was a man who was worthy before God. He condemned adultery, promiscuity, improper sexual relations. He condemned lust. In all of the Bible passages regarding sexual transgressions, Joseph Smith in the inspired version either left them untouched or strengthened their condemnation and strengthened their advocacy of sexual purity, morality, and avoiding improper sexual relations. Joseph Smith was not the author 
of what has been adopted in his name. No matter how much you may respect Brigham Young, no matter how much you may admire the pioneers and all that they went through, and no matter how much you may respect the sacrifices that were made by good women who were trying to obey God and put their hearts on an altar, who have earned my respect for what they did. The men were responsible for those errors, not the women. And the men will be held to account for those errors. Women did what they could. They raised their children in righteousness, and as has been so often the case, men apostatize from their responsibility, and women remain true and faithful to theirs. Mothers were mothers still, even under that pernicious system. But it needs to come to an end. And it needs to end in order for something ever so much better to finally return. Of that, I bear testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.